discussion this afternoon. This is a hot topic at the moment, and I'm sure for the foreseeable future, uh, social media, its effect on society, its effect on relationships, its effect on elections, um, and the day-to-day -day usage uh, of how we all engage with social media to some respect is, is something that we're all working through to get to a better understanding. So the foundation at, on our launch event in London a number of months ago talked about you know, issues like this and putting a stoic lens over uh, the issue and talking through it with, uh, with you know, like-minded stoics and others to see how we would approach you know, social media as an issue um, in today's modern society, but with a stoic mindset. So again, reminding us where we're trying to position our, our voice in the stoic world. And I would congratulate the organizers, organizers of Stoic recently. It was a fantastic event. And the amount of stoic energy and contributions from all over the world were, were really interesting, very compelling, and a wider audience that keeps coming towards stoicism in a very proactive way. Our focus is to participate in that world, but also to bring the youth voice into the conversation. So once again, we're really pleased to have Laurie with us, who uh, we met recently as a foundation uh, on, on the most recent event that we had the webinar. And we're delighted that she's joined us again today and also Ross, and you can see some of their backgrounds and um, we covered this last time, but we're delighted to have Ross and Laurie with us again today. In addition, uh, my great friend, John Sellers and partner who's joining us uh, as always. And John will be weighing in with various commentary throughout and bringing his expertise and academic lens and um, thoughtfulness around stoicism to the conversation that we're having today. So let's begin. We're talking about social platforms, how they affect us, the interaction amongst people, or in, interaction in business, interaction with governments, and, and, and affirmations and first impressions. So let's begin the conversation. Ross is going to kick us off here with some initial comments around uh, beginning the conversation. So Ross, over to you, please. Yeah, thank you very much, Justin. Um, I think um, social media is a is a very interesting topic to talk about, particularly um, from someone young like myself, um, because I think the relationship that many of us sort of build with um, with social media is fraught with many challenges that perhaps we don't always really take account of. Um, and one of them, as you can see, there is this this dynamic between external and internal affirmation. That, in other words, I think. One of the challenges that many young people face is that sort of when you're unsure of yourself and you're looking to sort of find your place in, in an increasingly strange world, um, that we look for affirmation through um, external sources, um, which can be quite difficult in something like social media, because obviously if we post something and no one likes it, um, that can be quite a difficult position to be in if that's where we've placed our source of affirmation. So I think this this stoic idea of really sort of being guided from within, from within your sort of character and by virtue, um, I think is really, really valuable because that helps us navigate this increasingly sort of challenging space into which many young people might otherwise sort of be drawn towards thinking maybe that if no one sort of likes their status, they don't get many reacts from it, then then maybe somehow that they're not sort of worth it, as it were, and that can sort of result in many serious mental health issues as well. So I think having that sort of stoic framework to guide young people to really think from within when they're using social media, um, rather than about what other people might think of what they post is, is really, really valuable. Ross, just before we get going uh, any further, I was wondering if you could share with us what you do on social media. And I'm also gonna ask uh, Laurie, and John as well, because I think it'd be good um, from a uh, transparency standpoint for people listening to the webinar, but also from a standpoint of generational um, engagement as well. So that affirmation and building that stoic uh, fortitude, if you will, that you're referencing there, Ross, but we'll, we'll pick that up in a second, but Ross, tell me, share if you don't mind the, the platforms that you engage in. Yeah, absolutely. So. Predominantly, I used um, Facebook and LinkedIn. Um, I used to use Twitter a little bit more, but um, 
as sort of the more I've used it, the more I realized that actually it was having a bit of a negative effect on me. So I thought the best decision was to completely remove it from, from my life in that way. Um, and still, even with things like Facebook, obviously, um, it's a sort of strained dynamic where I'm constantly thinking, should I really be on this? Is it really worth it? Is it sort of making a valuable contribution to to my life and the way I feel? Um, and it's a constant sort of to and fro between those things. And definitely not just my relationship with social media, but my relationship with my smartphone, I think is much like that, too. Very good. Laurie, would you mind sharing the platform and how you engage with social media? Sure. Um, so I think there are only three main platforms that I um, currently use, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn, uh, to various degrees. Um, and I think I get various things out of all of them. Um, I, I think I try to uh, have a balanced kind of approach and usage. It doesn't always work, uh, if I'm being honest. So I think that's something that, um, given our topic, is really important to kind of think about, um, you know, first impressions that... Um, there's the sense that you may get, I think, um, that it's imperative to, to be active, to be seen. Um, and I think it can be conducive to, to a false impression of, of that um, being uh, on social media excessively. So I try to kind of um, have that in the back of my uh, mind when I do engage. Very good, thank you. Uh, and John? Yeah, sure. So. I'm coming from a slightly different perspective in terms of generations. So I can remember um, being at an academic conference way back in 2005, 2006, and bumping into an old friend who I'd not seen for a while. She had a laptop with her and she said, look, there's this new thing. It's called Facebook and not anyone can join yet, right? It'd just been rolled out to a few British universities, I think Oxford, Cambridge and London. And it was invite only. So someone already on the platform had to invite you to join. It wasn't available to the general public. And she showed me this thing and she was like, you know, she was very excited about it just because it was a new thing, right? Um, if you like, I'll send you an, an invite email so you can join. Um, and it was literally just a Facebook. It was just a list of photographs with a list of names. And my immediate thought was, what's the point of that? So didn't pay much attention then. A Couple of years later, about 2008, I would say, um, uh, when it was much more widely used, I, I signed up to Facebook and I used it. And I was on Facebook for, for about three or four months and then I quit. Um, and there were a couple of reasons for that. One was I found it deeply addictive. I really did f feel that it was taking a huge amount of my time. And in fact, interestingly, and I'm sure we'll come back to the topic of smartphones later, um, I bought my very first iPhone at the time that I was using Facebook over these three or four months so that I could do Facebook away from my desktop computer on the train going to work or, or whatever, which was kind of a, uh, an indication of just how kind of compelling and, and, and addictive I found it. Um, but I quit, as I say, um, after not very long. And reflecting on it, I, my, my view was that this was a really toxic mixture of narcissism and voyeurism. It was about saying how great your life is, and it was about peering into the recesses of other people's lives. And that just struck me as something deeply psychologically unhealthy to be spending lots of time doing. So that, was, that is my experience with Facebook. I've not looked at Facebook since 2008, more or less. Um, then in 2012, um, a friend of mine was, uh, um, running a podcast. He invited me to do a podcast interview with him. And he was using Twitter to promote this podcast that he was doing. And he was using it in a very considered and restrained way. So it was just to promote the podcast he was doing and some other ac academic activities. And around that time, sort of inspired by what he was doing, I decided to join Twitter. And so I've been on Twitter since 2012, so what, eight years now. Um, but following his lead, I use it in a very restrained way. So I use it in a professional or academic way. I post information about events um, that I'm speaking at, publications that have come out, other things that are connected to my academic work. But I restrain any kind of personal stuff. I try to avoid getting in, involved in any kind of debates or discussions with people. I just try to use it 
as a way to kind of share information. Um, so that's my, my experience of social media. Well, thanks, thanks to everyone uh, for sharing. I think that's an important disclosure and transparency as we go through the rest of the conversation. To round that out myself, I don't do any of it on a personal basis, except for the foundation. And again, as you referenced there, John, the fact that I use it as a tool of information sharing. The businesses I'm involved in, et cetera, uh, they use it for, again, for, for marketing purposes, for customer engagement purposes. But on a personal basis, so professionally, yes, through business, I, I, I utilize it um, from, the, from the brand standpoint, but you would never see me personally on it. I made that decision when I saw this coming over the hill many years ago that for four reasons I, I did not uh, partake or participate. First, putting the stoic lens on it. And often I do think about things, would, would Marcus Aurelius, would Epictetus, would Zeno, would any of these guys think that this is a good thing to be on? And I really look through that, that stoic value set and that mindset and say, and my impression and my interpretation of stoicism, the answer would be no. Number two, it's a time value uh, question. Uh, I don't see the need for myself to be flicking across a screen uh, and likes and dislikes for a period of time every day. Um, not to say that's a bad thing, but for where, how I want to spend my time and the value proposition of time and how I used it, I decided that wasn't something for me. Again, not to say that it's not very important for other people. It, again, just a personal decision. Uh, third, privacy. Just, I don't think my life is that interesting to be showing everyone or even uh, friends and family on a daily basis. They can see all this stuff. So it was a privacy matter as well. And then uh, again, back to productivity. Um, I'd like to try and build a life of purpose and the productivity issue around social media. I find it very difficult to deal with and manage my wife, kids, dogs, family, friends, uh, social life, uh, the foundation, uh, business interests, et cetera, et cetera. And if I had three or four more platforms to try and work through and get back to people, I think it'd be near on impossible. Uh, I'm, I'm barely keeping my nose above uh, the responsibilities that I have now. So to add in more communication disturbance at that point, uh, I made a decision. But again, all of that is just a personal view. So let's get back to the, to the, uh, the, the slide here and impressions and, and affirmations uh, that Ross was, was referencing here. And I really like this, uh, this, this particular top quote here, Ross, you're you, coming from Epictetus, you are an appearance and not the only way of seeing the thing that appears. And the second quote here, man is disturbed not by things, but the view he takes of them. This second quote is quite powerful. I'd love to hear from Laurie and, and John on that point, man is disturbed not by things, but by the view he takes of things. And social media can create a very different view in some respects and therefore the impact. Laurie, what's any your any any views or opinions on, on, on that interpretation? Yeah, I think social media creates a very distorted view of uh, what the world is, of what um, other people's lives are. And I think um, it was Seneca who said that we tend to exaggerate, imagine, and um, sort of anticipate sorrows unnecessarily. And I think through social media, we very much um, do that. Um, we can sort of think, Look at look at everything that's happening, particularly with Instagram. In my opinion, um, it's um, it covers um, it, it. kind of displays a lot of um, ostensibly happy uh, pictures, happy lives, and I don't think it's very um, stoic the way that social media is uh, designed, the way it operates. Um, if you look at you know the cardinal virtues, uh, that's for sure. If we look at moderation. Um, there is a lot on, on social media um, that would um, kind of give an example of um, what you should do um, to be happy. This is what you should buy. Uh, this is where you should go. If, if you're not going on holiday in this particular place, then you're not um, happy. And so I think um, 
that is a distorted view. Um, I also think um, in relation to, to justice, I think there's a lot of uh, negative content, you know, uh, take body shaming, for example, that is very much present on social media. Again, that's not um, something that perhaps would be as exaggerated in real life. So I think it does, um, it can bring out a lot of uh, negative features of um, discussions between people. Um, and the other thing, um, I think is quite important is that we um, ideally would like as Stoics to, to use our reason and our logic in everything that we do and the way that social media platforms are designed um, simply does not allow that. So the algorithms aren't there to necessarily inform you or to um, help you make a judgment. Uh, they're, they're there to uh, influence you and to persuade you. And I think that kind of takes away from the um, control that you may, ha you may have internally over your own uh, sort of happiness because it emphasizes too much on externalities which should be indifference. And so um, it, it kind of linking to the dichotomy the dichotomy of control, it can be confusing as to what is within my control and what's not. Um, so those are just some general thoughts that I have. Yeah. Well, very interesting. I think the whole thing around distortion and potentially as John just referenced just now about addiction. Uh, and I think that's a common theme that seems to be coming out of the dialogue of the negativity of social media is the addictive nature of it, um, which can be, can be negative. John, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I thought what Laurie said then was very interesting. And there's a sense in which these platforms are built to make us immoderate, right? They're built to be addictive. They're, they're, they're designed to capture our attention and to, to keep us scrolling for as much as possible. The business model depends on that. There's a sense in which if you want to use it in a, in a moderate, restrained way, um, separate from the question of like the content that you're looking at, just in terms of how you, how, how often you're using the material, um, you're you're battling with something that has been designed to make that difficult for you, and 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 that's that's that can be a big challenge as well, I think. Yeah, no, I think so. Ross, any any additional comments? Uh, I think this was a great first slide about um, you know the external and the internal environment, how it can be affected dramatically by the impact of of social media. Anything that you'd round out on here, Ross? Yeah, just I think the the idea of first impressions is is quite valuable here because I think we've all seen on things on social media that have really taken us aback. And sometimes even um, I think in my case have provoked me to sort of think I should type something back immediately. But actually if you sort of view it through that prism of, of first impressions, it's okay to ultimately be quite shocked at something that you've seen on social media, but then ultimately it's within your control to then how to see how you respond to that, which includes obviously not responding to it at all. Um, so I think that sort of point around first impressions is is really valuable in terms of how we navigate our responses on social media. Very good. So let's go let's go into the next topic around roles and virtual you know, performative behavior. Uh, the questions here I think are really interesting. Are we truly ourselves on social media? What are the underlying motivations for our interactions? I think these are very, very interesting questions because it's been touched on already. One of the, one of the challenges, I think, when you're looking for authenticity in life, a real purpose, or sticking very close to reality, uh, social media has a tendency for people to promote only the best in themselves or a fabrication of, of, of a situation. I know that sometimes when my wife is, is looking through her various social channels and she'll show me a photo here or an example here of, of something in our in our network or etc and I'm often turned to her and say well I just don't really see that as being the reality of what that person's really about whether it's a positive or negative either way so Ross what how would you lead us off here in this in this in this conversation I think you're on uh, mute there Ross sorry there you go I think I think that's better now um, I think, as you've alluded to, I think it's important to be very introspective on social media. And um, because, as I think John mentioned when he was sort of deciding whether to use Facebook, there is, I think, some tendencies on social media that definitely for people with sort of underlying sort of narcissism or um, 
sort of sanctimony to gravitate towards these things. And I think it's all always really important to be introspective about that in ourselves. So for example, why are you posting a picture of yourself on social media? Is that gonna give people information? Is that gonna be valuable to them? Will it make them laugh perhaps? Those might be valuable reasons, but if it's sort of for your own vanity, obviously that's, that's something that perhaps isn't. So I think it's very important that when we're posting on social media that we try to make a, try to make a valuable contribution um, to our friendship network. Um, rather than sort of doing things that otherwise are not very virtuous. Yeah, yeah. Laurie, your thoughts here? Yeah, I think the question of whether we are truly ourselves on social media very much links to this idea of virtual performative behavior, because I think it is a performance in a sense. Um, you kind of deviate from who you really are and maybe uh, from even uh, what you think is right, what you think is good um, in, in exchange for performing a role, um, displaying a persona. And I think the reason behind that is because the focus is not on um, yourself or the community around you, even though uh, connection with the community is allegedly um, what makes social media useful. I think the focus instead is on the audience. So you do the things you do, you post the things you post uh, so that you get a reaction, so that you get a positive sort of reaction. And um, I think in that sense, um, it's very deceptive to yourself, to, to everyone else and um, not very conducive to, to inner peace. Um, yeah. I think uh, you bring up a very good point there. And I'm gonna ask John to comment here, obviously in a second, but. This particular quote from Seneca, at, uh, and it's referenced in both quotes here, which to be fully transparent again, uh, not only just for in, the, in the medium of social media, but pretty much my whole life. I've always been um, uh, skeptical and nervous of the crowd. So as a society, if we start heading one way, I generally have to check myself. I do check myself immediately because we have a, a history would dictate and has illustrated over time that we tend to get on big trends and often don't think before those trends. And in the business world, I can name an uh, uh, enormous amount of trends in the last uh, 20, 25 years that turned out to be utter total bust. But the crowd and the herd mentality jump on it quickly, whether it was the, the SNL crisis in the United States in the 90s, which then went into the dot com crisis in. Um, in the late 90s, early 2000s, which then um, went into, you know, the um, um, the mortgage crisis around 2008, where all these things just, you know, take off, and then someone has to wave the flag or they get manipulated with things. So, when the herd moves somewhere, I'm always a little bit skeptical. So Seneca is referencing it both here. It must be rescued from the crowd. It is so easy for for it to go over to the majority. And I think social media has a, a little bit of a tendency there. John, your thoughts from a stoic perspective here? Yeah, I I think here it might it's quite interesting to differentiate between different social media platforms and the way in which people use different platforms. So um, I've got a profile on LinkedIn. I don't look at it very often, but I, I um, which I didn't mention earlier. Um, so I know how that works too. I think one of the things that's interesting about, about something like LinkedIn, for instance, is people are clearly quite explicitly and openly curating um, a, a business profile, an online CV, if you like. Um, there's no suggestion that you're getting the whole person. People are clearly not talking all about their personal lives. You're just getting um, a curated professional profile. And because that's so evidently obvious and open, um, it kind of works, right? I mean, uh, it seems to be one of the more effective social media platforms. You know what you're getting, you know what everyone's doing. Um, and that kind of gap between the public presentation and what their real life may or may not be like, that gap is quite obvious uh, in, a, in a good way. Um, the thing, the thing with, with, with Facebook perhaps is there's that sense in which you're get you're supposedly getting um, a presentation of someone's complete life, but of course it is being very carefully curated, and um, certain things are being kept out of the picture, and people will inevitably want to put a positive spin on on things, um, and so then 
it's not quite so clear cut what the gap is between the um, public presentation and reality, and, and, and that's perhaps more problematic. Um, on Twitter, my experience is people just tend, like, tend to complain about things. There's lots of moaning that goes on, at least in my feed. Um, and um, whether that's good or bad psychologically for people to have to listen to is another matter. Yeah. I often think back, you know, thank you for those, those comments. I often think back to where the visionary who started these businesses, what they were intending at the time and what the reality of the business model uh, has evolved to now. And you mentioned something about curation there, John, that, you know, yes, from a LinkedIn perspective, you know, you know what you're getting, it's a resume online, but it doesn't tell the whole picture, but people are positioning and, in, and the other social platforms. Now we've got extreme situations at the very extreme fringe, of course, in a horrible situation where you're seeing people live streaming the most horrible events, whether it be mass shootings or other just extreme negative horrible human behavior and it's 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 able to be seen by such a wider audience or instantaneously as it's playing out and i think the original founders of these businesses would be horrified obviously that this is taking place but no one would have necessarily thought that through at the beginning or that you could shift uh sentiment or be manipulated or you could shift elections uh, uh in an unhealthy manner or in an unfair manner now, not to say that it hasn't been going on since history began. I mean, you know, the bribery that went on in ancient Rome and, you know, the voting for consuls and everything else was extreme. But now we're, it's so instantaneous and it's so powerful so quickly. And in some ways, the genie's out of the box. So I think that um, these, these behaviors and also the motivations behind them is, is, a, is a very powerful topic. So we, we're throwing this question out then uh, as, we, as we move forward here. How do we live in accordance with a digitalized nature uh, from a stoic perspective? So, you know, I think this is really in some ways the heart of the matter. How do you, how do you get to you know, live in harmony with a digitalized world and your platforms? Ross, any, any, any thoughts here to kick us off again? Yeah, I, I think we're going to touch on this slightly um, later in the presentation as well, but I think the dichotomy of control is, is really useful here because I think different people have sort of different levels of control that they feel like they can exert over social media. Different people feel like they can sort of go on it once a day and totally shut it off and be fine with that. And I think other people find it much more difficult. So I think acknowledging and gradually coming to a, a realistic sense of where your own sort of dichotomy of control actually lands is really important in navigating um, social media more generally. And I think a lot of people, um, especially young people, would do better to be a bit more introspective about that because I think especially someone like my little brother, for example, um, looks at his phone a great deal of the time. Um, and I think he knows that he'd rather not, but it's not really something that he's really come to terms with yet. Because I think he realizes that actually once he picks his phone up, he does, he's not really in control anymore. So then the answer is maybe he should sort of put his phone on the other side of the house. Maybe that's him being in control. You know, so there, I think are different layers of control that individuals will, will um, adhere to differently. And I think it's important to come to terms with that on an individual basis. Yeah, I think we're going to touch on that in a moment on, on the dichotomy of control and how how the addictive nature can distort someone's behaviour much more than they would uh, they would like in referencing. But we'll get to that in a moment. Laurie, any any opening comments here? Yeah, I think um, living in accordance with nature would imply a sort of deeper connection uh, with your surroundings, your natural surroundings, and that includes people. But I think what um, often is the case with social media is that it confines us to sort of our digital bubbles. And I think the way to kind of approach that would be through self-awareness. So similar to what Ross has just said, it, it is, um, up to the individual to kind of judge what works, what doesn't for, for themselves. And um, I think that has to come maybe with um, training, maybe through um, practice. I think uh, whenever I try to detach myself from social media, it's, it's uh, uh, 
not always as um, straightforward as I would like it to be. So I kind of take a step back and um, just um, reflect and find other things to do because it is addictive. I think at the end of the day, that's a really important part. Um, so it's a balance. I think it's uh, very much about moderation if we're being stoic. Yeah. John? Yeah, so I mean, I think one of the things that, that, that I'd want to say to kind of challenge this question is, you know, we don't live in a digitized nature, right? We live in the real world, right? Um, as Laurie was saying, there's this bubble and it can sometimes feel as if that's the real world. And the more time you spend engaged with it, the more real it feels because you're giving it so much attention. Um, but it's not the real world. The real world's out there. The real world is real human interactions and, and real relationships and um, all those other things that we used to do. So to come back to my kind of opening comment, I mean, my, I first heard about Facebook as this new thing in what, 2005, 2006. I mean, I was already well into my thirties then. I can remember life before social media. I can remember life before email and before the internet, right? So, I mean, I remember reading a, a, a piece recently um, um, someone saying about, you know, oh, you should do a digital detox, you should cut back. Um, you should put your phone on silent in the evening so you don't get alerts. My first thought was, why put it on silent? Turn it off. Just turn yeah. it off. Why does it have to be on 24 hours a day? Just unplug. There is no digitized nature. There's just this surface bubble that so many of us have started to feel is a significant part of the real world, but it's yeah. not. Yeah, I think you, you, uh, I took, I took four points out of that that exchange together. There, one, the digital bub bubble, which I'd like to talk on in a few moments, uh, civility, and the lack of it uh, in the digital world at times, where people feel very emboldened behind a, a keyboard or a, or a screen to say what they mostly say but would they say the same thing in front of that person as aggressively or as negatively the other thing which uh, john you just mentioned that reality and the problem of digital media is it can distort reality and we can talk that through in a moment as well and then the habits of management so for example i'm sitting in my office here but upstairs in in, in my bedroom and so forth um we have some we have some house rules that we just don't allow certain devices in certain rooms. And uh, my, my wonderful wife did certainly nothing at the dinner table at all, ever. No digital device at the dinner table, period. Uh, and um, so having that happen, but again, trying to, to create those disciplines to give yourself a break so that you stay attached to reality, I think is, uh, is a powerful discussion as well. So, if we talk, if we're looking in taking the conversation a little bit further, then if we're looking to stoic virtue rooted in intention versus modern virtue rooted in action, um, this quote from Seneca the Younger, cling tooth and nail to the following rule, not to give in to adversity, never to trust prosperity, and always to take full note of fortune's habit of behaving just as she pleases, treating her as if she were actually going to do everything it is in her power to do whatever you have been expecting for some time comes as less as a shock. Ross, I think you pulled this, this out and I thought it was a very powerful quote. And I do think it relates to social media in a couple of ways, but I'll let you take it away with some initial comments. Yeah, thank you, Justin. Um, I think that if you look at sort of many, um, many of the more um, divisive parts of, of social media, I think often I've at least seen friends um, and public figures sort of log on and think, oh my goodness, like what has happened after I tweeted or, or released that point of information on whether it's Instagram or Facebook or, or Twitter. Um, and essentially what they've said has been taken out of context or what they've said has been respond responded to in a way that they didn't expect. Um, and it's completely really destroyed their mental health without, without exaggerating for, if not the day, the week or, or the month. And, you know, and they're just constantly thinking about um, what actually happened around this. And so I think this sort of quote from Seneca is really valuable in recognizing that ultimately they're your own words. You knew how um, you meant them to be taken and providing you phrase them in a way that 
um, that took that into into mind, then I think you shouldn't be concerned with how the people misinterpret your words because ultimately that's within their control and, and not yours. So I think this can be really valuable in, in having a more resilient mindset when you engage in social media if you choose to do so. Yeah, I think that that's a key point which will probably open up more in the next slides is if you're gonna be on social media, you gotta be prepared to uh, expose yourself to a wider audience either intentionally or unintentionally and sometimes unintentionally and prepare as Stoics like to do to, to think about things that can go you know, on in the future, both positively and neg negatively, and sometimes more powerfully negatively is a powerful tool. Social media will open you up. There's no doubt. It, it, it has to by the nature of itself. It's very social. Uh, and that's an interesting concept for management as well. Laurie, your thoughts? Um, just that shock, I think, is something that um, is the intention um, when it comes to social media and why people engage. Uh, and I think if you detach yourself from it, um, you're less likely, less susceptible to the adversity, I suppose, the challenges that come with um, navigating various um, platforms. Yeah, very good. And John? Yeah, I mean, so as you were saying, you you've no idea who's ultimately going to be engaging with you if you're on a, a, um, a public platform and you, um, you, 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 you don't know who's going to be out there. You're going to meet a, a, a potentially a wide variety of people. Some of those people are going to be deliberately obnoxious. Some of those people might be willfully misreading what you're saying. Some people just might not just just might not get what you intended, right? There's always that gap between what someone intends and and how it's interpreted. And if you're well prepared for the fact that those sorts of misinterpretations could happen, and some people might respond in a negative or unpleasant way, and and you're prepared for that in advance, then it's going to come as less as a shock, and um, much less likely to disturb or upset you because you've you've anticipated it. So, the, you know, the Stoics famously talk about, you know, um, premeditation on, on future evils. And if you reflect on the fact that, you know, okay, there could be some unpleasant responses to this, but I'm, I'm ready for that. I'm expecting that that's part of the game. Um, and um, so as a consequence, it's not going to disturb me so much because um, I, I was well aware that that might come. Yeah. I think that's a very powerful piece and often we've all been there over the, over the years or uh, in various experiences where you're sitting up, you know, pre-social media or, or, you know, at the same time with the, with an email that you're sitting on and you're very upset, you want to fire it across and there's 25 people on the, on the response and you fired it and, or you fired it inadvertently, which I've done <laughs> occasionally. And uh, the repercussions, you know, I did it for the wrong, which we talked about previously, the wrong intentions. I did it because I was angry versus thinking through, calming down, and, and, and thinking about my intention more from a stoic perspective or a better intention standpoint. And I think the, the repercussions around social media and its engagement around addictive behavior is that you'll receive something and you can react very quickly without thinking it through. You were emotive, you saw something, someone said something, you wanted to correct yourself, you wanted to correct them, and you reacted and it caused a cascade of unfortunate um, reaction. Uh, and because it's so fast and instantaneous, it's, it's very difficult to withdraw, withdraw that written word uh, so quickly. And can I, Justin, can I just chip in something else on that? Of course, sir. yeah. So the, the, algorithms, the algorithms will push content to you that is most likely to elicit that kind of immediate reaction, right? Um, any content that has um, elicited that kind of immediate reaction from other people will then get pushed up the scale because it's it, it's precisely what the what the platform wants to achieve. So again, the system's working against you. The system's more likely to present you with content that you're more likely to react against, react to quickly and unthinkingly. Um, um, it's designed not to give you the space to reflect and think and, and respond in a slow and measured way, which is what we would want to do if we're trying to act according to Stoic principles. Yeah, no, very good. Moderation detachment. Uh, we've put some quotes here. Uh, Laurie or 
Ross, how would take this slide forward and how, how you see these interact with, with engaging between, and I think it really touches on, on you know, what Job mentioned there a little bit around, one of the things around social media is temperance and there's a historic value on temperance and as a key attribute in building a, a, a strong and formidable character is temperance. And unfortunately, it's often tested in the social media environment. Yeah, I, I think um, you're right. Um, you kind of have to be temperate to, to be moderate when it comes to interacting on and with social media because of um, of its nature, because you are bombarded with um, a, a vast number of um, um, posts that are not moderate. So having to kind of uh, counteract that personally um, is something to be cultivated. And um, I think that is relevant uh, for the, the things that you post, but also the amount of time that you spend on uh, the space you spend on social media. So it comes from different angles, but I think being moderate um, is the only way that will allow you as a stoic at least to um, kind of um, keep in touch with uh, the rest of the world. I think um, in terms of detachment, that is something that I've reflected on quite a bit and from a personal perspective, um, kind of in opposition to John's experience, I don't remember life before social media, I was born with it. And so detachment for me uh, was something that had to be learned, something that I'm still learning. So that's something that um, I'm, I'm happy I'm kind of aware of. Um, I guess the other thing is that as Stoics, we kind of read about uh, being indifferent to adversity, um, illness, misfortune. And I think social media kind of takes us in the opposite direction uh, in, in the sense that it kind of um, highlights um, various aspects of, of life um, that should be celebrated and sought after, which are really indifference. So um, all of those things that should be indifference, we take them as um, imperatives um, if we are not detaching ourselves um, in that sense. Um, so I, I think those are really important things to, to just be aware of in the first instance. And then uh, once you get there, you can kind of um, judge whether there are any changes that you should be making um, to uh, cope with that, I suppose. Yeah, no, very good. Ross, your thoughts? Yeah, I think it's, um especially with detachment, I think it's very interesting how often on, on social media, one of the difficulties that I think many young people face is that they sort of tie um, their sort of hopeful expectations of how people react to what they post to their own happiness. Um, and so I think people um, will, for example, look at something they post, they're about to post and think, oh no, will that get likes? Maybe I don't want to post it or equally, um, once it is posted and people don't react to it, um, we'll take it away, we'll delete it. I've, I've known many people who have done that. And I think that's quite sad because it's what, it, what it's showing is that ultimately people are posting things um, based on their expectations of how people will react. And if they don't meet those expectations, then they don't think their contribution is valuable. So again, this idea of internal and external affirmation and that looking internally perhaps is a, is a good antidote to some of these anxieties that people have around posting on social media. Yeah, I think you bring something up and it ties into this quote in the corner here, uh, the bottom left-hand corner with, with Marcus, where he says, if you are pained by external things, it is not that they disturb you, but your own judgment of them. And it is within your power to wipe out that judgment now. And one of the things that comes out continually in John's writings is about judgment and, and how the Stoic should approach judgment uh, as an aspiring Stoic and, and how it's viewed. John, your comments on that? Yeah, I mean, just to pick up on what Ross was saying, and this was a topic we touched on earlier, which is to do with the motivation of why someone is choosing to use a platform in the first place. And there are all sorts of very good and, and, and noble and, and sensible reasons why people might want to, to, to use a platform, maybe in a, in a, in a business context or marketing or um, or you know, a very real useful purpose for staying in contact with friends and family in another country, for instance. There are all sorts of positive ways in which people can use these platforms. Um, but again, to, in particular, to pick up on what Ross was saying, 
if people find themselves posting stuff just in order to get some kind of response rather than say to honestly share something that they think is important to them then 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 that's something that we might want to um we might want to check um and if someone finds himself just trying to post stuff to get a response then what happens when you don't get a response then you might start to post more extreme more controversial material anything to try and provoke some kind of reaction just to get noticed and then that's how the whole system just spirals out of control so again i think it's a question of coming back to intention why are people doing this what are they trying to get out of it and what's the purpose of doing this in the first place very good i think we've got a number of questions and comments coming in and uh, I've got a comment here from Sonia, who's come into to the conversation. And she says, great conversation so far. Thinking about it, social media seems to be the perfect playground to practice stoicism. And I think that's the other side of the coin here, which I think is a brilliant comment from Sonia, is that um, I would say in normal you know, reality of life, and engagement stoicism is a very powerful philosophy and a way of living to create purpose to create empowerment to create resilience uh, to create positivity um, but also you know to, to leap into the digital world and see much more behaviors driven in digital communication or posting etc by stoic behavior with the things that we've been talking about thus far would improve the environment of social engagement on those platforms i think dramatically uh, so I think it's a comment uh, well put. We're certainly running through this conversation today very, very strongly, which is great. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very, um, it's a very uh, interesting topic and it's a very valid topic for where we are in society today. Let's move on then to the dichotomy of control. Are we really in control when we use social media is a question we're putting out there. Where does our control begin in, in, in addictive behaviors? And then finally, do we rethink our relationships with our smartphones? I think these are really terrific questions. So uh, Laurie, would you would you kick us off here? Sure, I think the dichotomy of control is, a, is an interesting one here um, because with social media, there's this sense, this uh, illusion that uh, we can control um, other people's perceptions of us, for example. So uh, if we post something, we, um, we may think we have a direct impact on uh, how we're perceived and I think it kind of it's um, a bit problematic because it's probably not true you, you certainly have influence over how you present yourself and over what you say and what you do but ultimately um, there there's a trap that may come with um, posting on social media in that it probably confers a, a sense of control that is exaggerated um, that's my kind of take on it Ross, your thoughts around these questions? Yeah, I think this is a really interesting one um, because I think if you ask someone, sort of, do you spend more time than you would like to on social media? I think you would get an overwhelming yes to that. And that would seem to imply that across the board um, that really we're not in control in social media in, in the same way that we might be if we um, have other hobbies, like are you um, in control when you play sports? Of course, you don't play sports any longer than you want to. It's just an ordinary part of life. And so I think the um, the the difference there with social media sort of highlights how really it's just getting away from us in, in ways which we haven't really come to expect. And I think more than that as well, there have been interviews with the people that built these platforms and they've quite interestingly said that they don't allow their children to use them. And to me, that would imply that clearly um, given their expertise, this is something we need to take much more account of and really be introspective about whether we are in control on these platforms. Um, and certainly in my own case, I've, I've definitely had to sort of rethink how much I use these platforms, sort of how I use my phone on a regular basis and what sort of systems I put in place to make sure that I'm not spending more time than I should be. Because I think from a stoic perspective as well, the thing that comes up again and again and again is really the value of time. I mean, time is one of the most valuable resources we have. And so to waste it um, is not something that I want to do. Yeah. I think that, that that's a very powerful piece around the time and valuing it and understanding through this engagement, 
that it's important. And, you know, we've, we, the conversation where, and the discussion is really trying to work through social media, there's, there's the negative uh, uh, themes that kind of re recur during the slides as we go on. There's a lot of positivity in social media as well. Um, but in e either case, whether it's positive or negative, this still comes down to the time invested. I like your comment around staying, you know, playing sport or staying healthy. You only do that to a certain amount each day, and that is proportionate to the time you have and how what your goals are in that in, in those areas. And social media possibly should be accounted for in, in that sense as well. John, your thoughts around these questions? Yeah, I mean, one of the things I just think is so striking is that we're having this conversation at all and that we're even asking these questions. I mean, it's often been commented that we wouldn't we're highly unlikely to ask these sorts of questions about other forms of technology, right? Whether it be a bicycle or a car or your refrigerator, all sorts of other incredibly useful pieces of technology, you know, um, you know, an old fashioned typewriter or word processor. These are simply useful tools that you use for the task that you want to do. And then you walk away from them. And, and that's what technology ought to be. It ought to be something that's incredibly useful that enables us to do things either more quickly and efficiently or things that we couldn't have done otherwise. Um, and we're in control of that technology, right? Um, and this seems to be an example or a, a form of technology where um, we're constantly having these, these discussions about whether we are in control of how we're using it or not. I mean, that in itself, I think, should flag some, some major concerns for us. Um, we wouldn't be having this conversation about, you know, I really like driving my car um, but I just can't stop, right? Um, I just keep having to drive around the block again and again because it's so much fun. I mean, that just doesn't, we don't have that kind of conversation. Yeah, no, very well put. The dichotomy of control continuing, and obviously this quote, the serenity prayer, um, brings in a lot of the discussion and, uh, uh, and brings it to a, to a, to a summary. And, and I think working through social media, uh, and it's positivity, but also some of the, the negative pitfalls. Um, and if you're getting on a negative uh, uh, control dynamic with, with social media, then this is a powerful quote to where do you know where the difference is and have the wisdom to know where, look, I've got to balance this better. Ross, did you have any comments here that you would add to this? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, um one of the most pertinent, pertinent things about this quote is how well it ties in with, with the image to the left. Now, this is actually an image of a container that most people use for food addiction. So for example, if they don't want to eat a cupcake or whatever it is, um, they'll put this in that safe and it's a timed safe. Okay, but what's increasingly happening is that people are now using this for their phones. So people, in other words, are putting their phones in a timed safe, setting a timer so that they don't use it. Okay, and this is something um, which really um, goes back to the dichotomy of control in the sense that many people don't feel like they can pick up their control, pick, pick, pick up their phone, excuse me, and trust themselves. Okay, so I think this is, this is very interesting in terms of where does your line get drawn? Is it when you pick up your phone? Is it when you open the social media app? Is it, um, is it further down the line when you begin to post something and you think actually I'm gonna to spend too much time on, on things here? So really sort of having the introspection again to accept um, the things that you cannot change, maybe that there are addictive patterns here. And increasingly, I think we're gravitating towards social media to fulfill perhaps social needs, which um, ordinary life doesn't fulfill, um, which I think is, is the wrong way to look at things. Because if you're sort of isolated, perhaps you don't have a, a sense of belonging in your own life, then more and more you might look on social media to perhaps fill that void. But in reality, I think that, that social media um, often doesn't fill that and just ends, um, ends up leaving people back where they started. Yeah. No, exactly. So we've got a couple more slides here and obviously the time's running out on us here. So here's, a, here's an interesting uh, question uh, for all of us. Is social media challenging or beneficial? And maybe taking that a little bit further, net, 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 is it a, is it a positive or a negative? Or how does everyone feel with their own experience and engagement? And I think there's a generational uh, uh, on this call between myself and John, who, and I agree with John, I, I didn't grow up with any of this. You know, I can remember growing up and seeing the first TV, black and white, two channels in West Queensland, Australia. That was a big deal when that arrived when I was about five. 
and the, the telephone on the wall. Uh, that was it. Um, and, and the old line system of calling as well. It was very interesting just to have that perspective, which my children will never understand. So, you know, I think, you know, and then you have to look at this in the grander scheme of, of influence as well. You know, you have whole organizations out there in certain parts. I was watching last night a documentary about the trolling system in, in Russia within the Russian government. And you've got people that are just go to work every day in a government function, going around the world, causing disruption and misinformation. Now that can't be a good thing because it's distorting the truth. So it's a, it's a tough question to answer, but if I, if, I take, if I take the first leap here and I'm trying to be balanced and I'm probably the least qualified to talk on this question because of I don't participate really on a personal basis, is social media challenging or beneficial? I would lean towards not, that I'd lean towards a negative um, uh, net net for social and greater good benefit because I see what it does to other people. I see addictive behaviors. I see misinformation. Uh, I see a waste of time that people influence, that comes into influence in their lives. So uh, I'll probably be trolled for that comment, but <laughs> be that as it may, I do see it that way. But uh, Ross, how about you? Tough question. Yeah, it, it is a difficult question. I think um, the way that it's framed between challenging or beneficial, I think is, is useful in a way because I think it's certainly challenging and whether it's negative or, or beneficial, I think is, is more complex, but I think it's, it's challenging in that the way I see social media is, is sort of a divide between um, it being beneficial in terms of um, having it as almost uh, a resilience builder. So in the same way that I think Seneca talks about um, how individuals should be a rock against sort of the waves that that constantly hit you in your life um, and that the stoic mindset is is um, personified I should say a metaphor for that um, I think that social media can sort of be the waves and and hopefully you can be the rock but it just remains to be seen whether um, whether you can can really withstand the, the onslaught of social media and I think as John's alluded to, it's built in such a way to make things incredibly challenging. Um, so I'd like to think that I can be the rock, but I'm, I'm not sure that remains to be seen. And I think overall, I'd say it's actually been a negative. Okay, Laurie. I think there's some obvious benefits in terms of access to information, easier access to, to people, to communicating with people. Um, but I, I do tend to take some of the positives with a pinch of salt because I know that a lot of um, what we believe are positives when it comes to social media are um, programmed uh, for, for us to deem them that way. So all the algorithms, all of the notifications, all of the uh, mechanisms and um, designs of, of um, various platforms uh, make it so that um, we um, get some sort of um, satisfaction or psychological uh, fulfillment, which, which is not um, really based on anything intrinsically valuable, I would say. And the fact that there are a lot of people who um, begin each day by checking their phones, um, by um, going to bed and checking their phones once again, and by effectively being glued to their phones is quite revealing. So I think um, I'd have to probably um, agree with you, Justin, on the final judgment on social media. Okay. And John. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. So I think. I think we could draw a distinction here between social media on the one hand and the internet on the other. And I think there are some things that I can think of that have been beneficial through social media. So for instance, um, in modern stoicism, where we've been promoting Stoic Week, we've done that primarily through social media over the last however many years we've been doing it. And we've reached lots of people and there are all sorts of online Stoic communities. Um, and I've, come into contact with all sorts of really interesting people through those channels. And so you can see, okay, that's a whole range of benefits. So we need to weigh that against the negatives. But for old people like me and you, Justin, I can remember things from 20 years ago before any of this, before any of the big social media companies existed. I mean, people used to write blog posts that still existed online. Um, there used to be things called Yahoo groups where people would have email discussion lists and there was indeed a stoic Yahoo group list back in the late 90s um, where people could still connect and they could still make these online communities. 
but it wasn't done through the algorithms of social media. And so I think there are some positives that we can take from the, from the internet um, that we could hold on to and we could build online communities, uh, make contact with people around the world without having the more pernicious aspects of social media. So I think on balance, I would agree with all of you that, that, that social media is, is probably having a negative influence. And the things that we might associate with it as being positives, we could still hold on to outside of those, those very um, um, restrictive platforms. Well, these are, these are really uh, great, great responses. And I think there's a leaning towards the net negative, but one of the things I would just comment, and it, it, it's, it's related to stoic thought around life anyway, is that you know, sometimes these mediums, whether it's a platform, the internet, social media platforms, you can make the argument that in and of their own right, they are good things. But it's the nature of man and woman and human beings that tend to take things, the medium itself and distort it negatively. Whereas if, we're, if the general engagement across all individuals was, I'll, I'll be biased and say stoic in nature, we wouldn't have this negativity coming through. The ability to send, send communication or images or or so forth without addictive behavior, without negativity, or when I say negativity, it's, it's not that we can't debate or disagree, uh, but one of the biggest problems that we're having in social media right now is civility and the ability to talk uh, in a uh, controlled and measured and even di you know, disparaging way, but with a, uh, well, not disparaging, but disagree with someone. It seems that the mediums are struggling to control that in a, in a, um, in a fair and balanced way. We're, we're, we're actually over time, uh, um, um, unfortunately, because this is a topic that could go on for quite some time. And there's been a bunch of commentary come in around, uh, you know, making uh, comments uh, around the positivity of stoic groups, which you mentioned, John, uh, and, and driving stoicism through these pl platforms, um, stoic goals and minimizing the negativity. There's comments around asking advice about that, you know, how to build friendship networks, how to balance the time. There's a whole bunch of stuff here. So we've definitely, um, you know, struck a nerve here with people around it because it is something that everyone is considering. We'll close on this, this, this slide here. We've got another one, which we'll, we probably won't get time to talk to, but I think I put this slide in last night talking about the key is to keep company only with people who uplift you, whose presence calls forth your best from Epictetus. And I love this quote because we've touched on this before in the conversation. Um, you know, one of the key things in life is who you surround you with. That's a fact. You know, whether it's your family, your friends, or your business associates, or your mentors, or whatever. And the, it's been well proven over time that, uh, you know, antisocial behavior, negativity, or what have you, addictions, whatever, can be triggered by, you know, peer group pressure. The thing about social media is that, as we've touched on, you've got to be fully aware that you're opening yourself up to a huge company, if you will, uh, that sometimes is intended and unintended. And I think social media is something that um, you have to be prepared to take on an onslaught, either intentionally or unintentionally, based on the comments and the, and the things you put out there. Because invariably, once it's out there, it can't be retracted. It's out there forever. And I think that's another thing that people are struggling with in terms of what they post uh, and how they try to take it down. So, look, we'll probably, ha unfortunately, have to, to look to close here now. Uh, I'm going to ask John um, to comment on some suggested reading here real quickly. Yeah, so here are four books. Um, I've read all these books at different points. Um, I just comment on them very quickly. So the first one, The Shallows by Nicholas Carr is about the way in which we're becoming increasingly distracted um, through social media in particular, but, but, but other things online too, which um, gets in the way of us doing the sort of deep reflective thinking that we all ideally um, um, uh, would benefit from doing. Um, uh, Yaron Lanier's book, 10 Arguments for Deleting Your Social Media Accounts Right Now, does exactly what it says on the tin, a great polemical book from one of the leading figures at the beginnings of the internet age, right? So he's, he, he knows what he's talking about and he talks about civility, politics, the undermining of truth, 
um, the generation of bad emotions like anger, um, all of these things. Um, Digital Minimalism by Cal Newport, again, interestingly, a professor of computer science, so he knows what he's talking about. Um, and this is a very practical book that outlines a series of ways in which you can just reduce the amount of time that you're spending online and just reconnect to the real, to the real world. Um, and then the last book um, by Carissa Velez, just come out the last month or so, Privacy is Power, primarily concerned about data, um, but really it has lots to say about social media, how the companies are set up and operate, their business models, how they're designed to basically extract as much data as possible out of you, um, focused around that well-known saying, if you're not paying for the product, then you are the product. Yes, very good. John, thank you for that. There's some great reading there. Uh, which reflects a lot of the conversation we have today. We also, as a group, believe that uh, it'd be very, a lot of people, it's actually been referenced in one of the questions this afternoon or a commentary that I've just received, that it's very worthwhile to read the film, uh, oh, sorry, to see the film, The Search of Dilemma, uh, and some of the comments that Ross made and, and Laurie's points uh, are reflected, certainly in this uh, Netflix um, um, show, which I thought was very, very powerful. On that note, I'd like, to thank you. I'd like to thank you again, Ross and Laurie and John for participating this afternoon. Uh, as always, it's greatly appreciated on behalf of the um, foundation. Uh, a quick just update very quickly. We've got a webinar with Eve Richards soon, who's a fascinating stoic lady, which we're looking forward to um, having conversations with her and her journey into stoicism. We've got uh, another webinar soon uh, with Sukras and Dhruv coming through. Uh, which will be on a topic of their choice, which I'm hopeful that John will join me on. We are still planning towards a 2021 Athens Aurelius Foundation event, which we're keen to start putting some, some dates to, but we're obviously subject to the uh, global pandemic and what the world looks like, but that is uh, certainly going to start to take shape soon enough. And then next week, we do have a um, very interesting, in, interesting conversation on Stoicism and Elite Sport with 1987 Wimbledon champion Pat Cash. So you can register for that event at AureliusFoundation.com events and social. Um, and that's it. So look, thank you again, John, Laurie and Ross. Thank you, Holly, for the orchestration as always. I apologize, it's my fault. We've got a bunch of questions and commentary coming in. I referenced uh, a number of those, but unfortunately we didn't get to those questions the way that we normally would because we simply, <laughs> were engrossed in conversations. So without further ado, if there are any further questions or anything, please feel, through, feel uh, free to send them through the foundation. We'll come back to you. And on that note, we'll leave everyone there and thanks everyone for their time again. Have a great weekend.